George is a former Marine, a one-time boxer, a naturalist, a farrier by trade. He shoes horses, makes horseshoes, treats horse ailments, cooks, sews, and welds. He usually gets away with his blunt directness because of a twinkle in his eye, his right eye, the good eye. <laughs> Sometimes his droopy left eye can make you feel like he's staring at you down a long gun barrel. George likes Robert Rourke, another great North Carolina writer. He likes his quote about the Cape Buffalo. He looks at you as if he, you owe him money. <laughs> Whenever I do something wrong George doesn't like, he ices me down with that gun barrel stare and says, do that one more time and you'll have breakfast in hell. <laughs> It's about 5.45 a.m. and George and I, along with our friend Tom Rankin, are walking across a horse pasture. The grass is wet with dew. And this is my first turkey hunt. We're toting our guns and duffel bags that are filled with decoys and little fold-out camouflage chairs. We get to the woods and George whispers for us to follow him. He soon motions us to our spots and places our chairs against the trees. He plants the decoys out about 15 yards in front of us and we sit very still. George brings a turkey call to his mouth and I hear what sounds as far as I know, exactly what a hen calling out to a long lost lover sounds like. <laughs> Told you I was gonna do that. <laughs> We sit not moving as morning comes. What begins to happen is a long is what begins to happen is way beyond hunting. It's meditation. I meld with and meld into the woods, become a silent non person, see and hear the world as it awakes in this creation. And I'm a silent witness as I see this. Begin, birds begin to move, one tweets, then several, and a breeze awakens. Colors seep into the trees and the bark, and as if light is slowly rising from the ground. George makes another call, this time an owl call, a shock call. I listen as the gob I listen for a gobble from far off far away, but there is none. After an hour or so, we're moving across a big pasture. Again to another spot. Dark, black-green cedars punctuate the rolling Piedmont Hills. We had a drought last summer and a winter, but the last week has brought rain. The woods are fresh. The countryside feels like a sacred place I've lost. Because of my life with, with books and abstractions and classrooms and city, because of my choices, I envy George's kinship with these woods. When we, when we talk on the phone the next morning, when I try to tell him what it all meant to me, he will tell me that slipping through the woods to hunt is his therapy. It's the only therapy he needs, he will say. And then I will say, well, maybe. <laughs> we are about to cross a creek and George tells me to follow him. I see a crossing spot that seems easier than his. I step on a sandbar and sink halfway to my knee. My boots fill with sand and water. I told you to follow me, George says. When are you gonna to learn to follow orders? We get settled in, all set up again behind decoys, and I wonder how I'll be able to write about all this. I will not be able to describe the feeling of disappearing into the vast and secret and sacred while here in the woods with good friends. What I will have to say is that today we will neither see nor hear Mr. Tom Turkey. We finally pack up and head out for a little lunch. 
On my way home, George stops his truck by a friend's barn. We get out. And he gets out and loads several long rods of rebar in the back of his pickup truck. Tom and I pull up in Tom's truck just behind. And Tom sees that the rebar is sticking out the passenger side. Clyde says to Tom, that rebar is going to hit somebody walking along the road. I think you're right, Tom says. <laughs> Be patient. <laughs> I holler out to George, you're going to hit somebody in the head with that rebar. He walks over to me and looks at me through the open passenger window, gives me that down the gun barrel look and says, not if they get out of the way. <laughs> now, <laughs> just one more thing I have to say about Clyde before I, before I get out of here. Um, how many of you folks out there have ever searched for a four-leaf clover? I assume there's a few. You know, if you find one, it represents luck. And uh, it's supposed to bring you luck. Clyde, through his music, if you discovered him that way, or through uh, his painting, most of us know him through his literature and his books. Think about how lucky that is. Uh, to me, I'm, a, you know, I'm, a, I'm blessed because not only do I know him because of his literary work but he's been a close friend for 25 years. And uh, I can say right now that uh, I'd like to present what I consider our four-leaf clover, Clyde Edgerton. <laughs>